Hey, welcome back to the studio. This is My Day of Play, where you're taken into the real events and actions of how it happens long before the process of editing or cleaning up. This is how it really went. Today, I spent time with fellow podcaster and author Tyler Mahan, who gets into the gut of the story about George Jones and Tammy Wynette. After that, we share a lot of fun and laughter with two amazing actor comedians, now podcasters, John Gatto and Steve Byrne. Have you heard of Uncle John's Bathroom Reader series? We're breaking it down with the dude himself, Brian Boone. Then we're going to wrap things up with music historian Scott Shea as we celebrate 50 years with Van Morrison. My day of play, absolutely 100% unedited. Letting you see the wizard behind the curtain. And was that background noise too much? I tried to I like hear any, it. I didn't hear any noise in the background. Okay, great. Yeah. Arrow, good morning. How are you doing? Hey, you got a NASA shirt on today, man. Thanks for promoting space. I do. I'm flying high. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I uh, sent you an email, so when you get a chance, uh, just let me know. All right. Excellent. Excellent. All right. You have 20 minutes. Excellent. Good morning, Tyler. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Arrow. What are you? What do you got going on in this picture right here? That's a Native American coup stick, and what that is amazing. Is people would, you know, the different uh, nations would come together, and they would go up to their worst enemy, and they would touch them on the shoulder to show courage and confidence. And I look at it as being, well, man, if you're going to get that close, let's build a relationship and be friends. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Dude, I got to congratulate you on on this because, you know, a lot of people don't realize that podcasting started with authors. It wasn't the comedians. It wasn't the musicians. And I love the fact that you were pulling this book from your second season of that podcast. It shows the true connection and the roots of what this is all about. Uh, well, that is actually news to me. I know very little about the history of podcasting, so I'm sure you could tell me more than I would know about it. Which authors? Well, you know, it, it was just those that just wanted their voices to be heard. And I think that's what drew me to it back in 2012 was the fact that it was like, I just, I, I have all of these things, but it's the voices in my head. How do I get them to somebody else? Yeah, that makes sense. I think it, I have always thought of it as radio, sort yeah. of a return to old school radio. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you on that. And and people are, you know, bringing it into their personal lives because of that, because it's content. It gives you something other than the same 12 classic rock songs. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's something that uh, is really an issue for me. Uh, I, I get really used to a playlist. I can tell if I'm listening to a playlist and it's the same one every day. I, I can't do that for too long, you know? But look at what you're doing with Cocaine and Rhinestone. I grew up a huge George Jones and Tammy Wynette fan. In my family, they were royalty. And then you release this book. I, I want to give it to my mom and dad. But then again, I do. You do want to give it to your mom and dad? I do because I want them to know that, you know, that not everybody is perfect I, because they put them on that, that, that stool and they, and they, they thought they were the greatest thing that ever happened. Yes. Uh, so yes, a, a lot of the book is concerned with sort of getting into the specifics about how much of the story that was sold to fans was not actually true. Mm-hmm. But it's not as though I am simply delighting in tearing that down and just leaving it in shambles and walking away. My aim is to sort of remove the veil so that we can see what was actually going on and replace the myth with a truth that to my mind is equally fascinating and actually i would say even important if our aim is to truly understand the music of george and tammy their lives how that fits into the larger story of american history and even world history the the book takes a much wider lens than is uh obvious from just looking at the cover well, but once you get into it it really opens up a whole world well you're putting me on a on a unique little path because as i read the book and i digest the book i'm going back and i'm listening to their music i'm listening to the lyrics and it's like it's like they they, they kind of go hand in hand and and you get a different point of direction and view of what what it was really like Yes, absolutely. And I mean, that, and that's very intentional, um, not so much on the part of George and Tammy as the part of their producer, mm-hmm. a guy named Billy Sherrill. He was sort of the Svengali or puppet master behind 
the scenes in he was working with a crew of professional songwriters in Nashville and it's a very like a small clique where they were all in this little club and you know not a lot of outsiders were allowed in and that enabled them to all work with the same strategy sort of this playbook which was if there's a big story that breaks about your artist then we want to write a song that sounds like it could be this artist talking about this big story when it's someone like george jones a lot of like famous troubles with addiction and substance abuse if there's a song that we could write that seems to be about that then it comes across as more real you know uh to the audience or with Tammy Wynette, once she becomes involved with George Jones, well, he's clearly getting in trouble over here. So <laughs> what would she feel like about that? So let's do that kind of a song. And then what's interesting is the, when you're looking at the singles, the, the, the ones that they were really pushing to sort of set the narrative, you get one idea. But then if you start digging around in album credits and seeing, okay, well, here's a song that was never a single, but Tammy Wynette, is the writer of it what's that song about when did she write that and then you're like oh wow this is probably how she was really feeling at this time even though that didn't become a huge part of the story so i guess that's sort of an example of what i mean when i say once you get below the surface level of what they're telling you to look at once you start looking around at all this other stuff there's just as much fascinating material in the true version of what was really going on tyler i call that hidden speak as a daily writer i believe hidden speak is where we really have our true emotions and we don't want people to know what we're really thinking and how we're going to react we put it in a different language and other people get their own interpretation And Tammy spoke of that in interviews. She would say that when she was writing a song, she would pretend that this stuff was happening to someone else. And I think that she sort of did that in her own mind as sort of a trick to get out of her own way to write these songs when really they were things that happened to her. She was just pretending that it had happened to someone else. It was sort of a way to short circuit past that. um, Am I talking about myself too much or worrying about those sorts of things? You just tell the story as if it happened to someone else. Yeah. The song, She Thinks I Still Care. I still see that song as being social media before social media became cool. I could see that. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, because, I mean, it really, I mean, I I swear to God, every man sat up when they would sing this song. Because, I mean, it's almost like, God, he could be singing about my life or somebody that I know that's close to me. Well, so that song is sort of the moment that George Jones became cemented in everyone's mind Mm -hmm. as, oh, this guy is clearly the best country singer on the planet right now. Like no one else is even close. Uh, And and if you listen to his vocal performance on that song, you will hear why it's uh, I could spend a lot of time talking about uh, his singing on that song. And I have. But uh, I, I think he could have been singing about anything if he sang it like that and everyone would have sat up and paid attention. But the fact that he was singing about what he was singing about really brought a lot of people online and uh, connected them to uh, his soul kind of, I I think that he really bared a lot of himself in that performance. And it's, it's still very powerful and moving today with his vocal stretching that he does in there. I mean, it it always reminds me of John Lennon and, and, and how he was forced to kind of stretch his vocals as well. I, I've always wanted to know if George went, you know, went in there on purpose and, and stretched things so that we could truly feel the inside of his soul. So that ha- that song was recorded within a few years of him coming from Texas, which was a lot of not bad, but uh, make do studios. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not as if the sound quality was terrible. It just wasn't, you know, the top of the line down in Texas. And then he goes up to Nashville and we're talking state of the art recording studios he's working in studios that were built by a guy named owen bradley who uh, may have invented a lot of the things that we take for granted in modern recording studios to control sound waves and reflection and make everything sound good and that sort of stuff so i think that once jones came to nashville is when he was really able to hear himself for the first time so i think you're almost hearing 
a conversation he's having with himself where he's hearing his voice of what it sounds like and sort of, oh, well, what if I did this? And what if I did this? And can I push this even further than I thought? And uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you sing, but if, if you're a singer, you can get comfortable and all of a sudden it's almost like you're not even the one doing it that's anymore. Right, right. You're just, you're sort of listening to it along with everyone else. And I think that's sort of what we're hearing there. God. And, and let me tell you about being a musician. When you go back to those songs that you left behind two and three years ago and you go, why, why did I, what, what's the story on this? And it's almost <laughs> like you've dropped a piece of yourself off and that breadcrumb is the one that continues your journey. Yes, absolutely. And um, and it's the same thing as a writer, too. You can go back to something that you wrote a long time ago, and sometimes even you'll start reading it and not realizing that it was something that you wrote. <laughs> You're just like, wow, this is pretty good. Who did this? It's like, it was you. <laughs> did they use Hee Haw as a promotional tool? In other words, when George was in trouble, get him on Hee Haw so people can start thinking and positive things about the guy again. And Because Tammy was on there a lot as well. Uh, I've never heard anything like that with Hee Haw, but maybe uh, it's certainly plausible. That is the way that those kind of things get talked about. Um, with Jones, he suffered from stage fright yes. really badly. So whenever there was a, a huge problem or something went really wrong, the tendency with him was to run away you know, um, to just get away from cameras and microphones and reporters and hide out and hopefully not, hopefully everyone would just forget about him for a while, you know. Yeah. Um, Tammy, on the other hand, is much more likely, I would imagine, for what you just said to have taken place. It, her her approach seemed to be to try to do damage control yeah. and, and, and do a bunch of interviews, which uh, unfortunately, had the tendency to achieve the opposite of its intended effect. It seemed like the more she talked, the more she got herself in trouble because she would try to control the narrative and uh, wind up saying things that were not true and were very easy for someone to just go verify what the truth actually was. And that uh, eventually had a lot of negative effects on her career, a lot of her fans sort of felt um, lied to because yeah, they were yeah. being lied to. Yeah. Let's talk about that stage fright because I have put a lot of time in studying the, the plan and the purpose of that because even Carly Simon went through that. And the one thing that I'm learning is that stage fright is when you no longer believe in the character that you have become and you want to change but you don't because everybody else still wants George Jones. Do you think that he just did not want to be George Jones? Uh, that's a really great way to put that, that you just said i like I, I may have said earlier so i've done a lot of these interviews my father had me on stage before i could read so i've always uh been probably more comfortable with being on stage mm -hmm. than most folks would be but uh the everything i know about stage fright it does sound like what you just said is accurate that it, it's it's so much of a fear of I'm going to be found out. Everyone's going to know that I'm not supposed to be here. And, uh, and yeah, I think with George Jones, it obviously wasn't a fear that he was going to go out there and be a bad singer. You know, he, he was not an egotistical man, but he did know what he was capable of doing with his voice. I, I think that the issue with him is once he became really famous, mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the uh, you you start to realize that you're not in control of what people think about you is essentially what happens when you get famous. And uh, and that's not to say that you're concerned that everyone's going to think negative things about you with Jones. It seems like the concern was all of these people think I'm a better person than I really am. All of these people think that because I can sing well, that I must be a great guy mm -hmm. and I'm not perfect, you know, and he, that again like that that is also a bit of a i could see how that could sound like a bit of a ridiculous thing to worry about you know i'm not perfect everyone's going to find out i'm not perfect but when you've got thousands of people in front of you projecting some ideal version of who you're supposed to be the fear of not living up to that 
uh, quite literally is crippling, and as we've seen with so many entertainers and certainly with George Jones. I would love to know what he saw and how he spoke to himself in the mirror. Because even even if he's under the influence or if he's just George, you know, dry dr- George, I mean, th- he had to have had conversations with himself in that mirror. Yeah, he did speak a little bit about this because he was – he was in a position of trying to understand himself and trying to understand his addictions and substance abuse just as much as anyone else. And, uh, in his day, we did not have the language that we have now. We did not have even the school of thought that we have now to understand these issues, but he did speak about at one time learning that, uh, adults who, were victims of child abuse as he was his father was an abusive alcoholic uh you tend to as a, as a young child the tendency is to assume that you deserve this if a parent is behaving this way towards you it must be your fault you must have done something wrong because parents know the way the world's supposed to work and if you're being punished it's because you've done something wrong so it seems like Jones really internalized that idea. There's, I'm broken. There's something wrong with me. Mm-hmm. And, and, even, and even if he didn't know what that was, he was just taking his father's word for it. You know, So that would be an, a compounding problem when it comes to what we were just speaking about, getting on stage in front of thousands of people. But they don't, they, they're going to find out I'm broken. They're going to find out there's something wrong with me. There's gonna, they're going to find out there was a reason that my father abused me. And uh, it, yeah, it just all sort of tumbles in on itself. And I don't know uh, how long it took him to sort of figure all of this stuff out for himself. It does seem like he eventually did. Um, You know, part of his story is that redemption storyline where in old age, it does seem like he was able to sort of put a lot of those demons to bed and just sort of settle into being a regular guy. Wow. As a mobile DJ, I, I still play George Jones's music. And I think the reason why I do that is because I love to watch older people freak out in the way of, oh, my God. Oh, my God. He's playing George Jones. I mean, he still has an effect on people today. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the great things about his discography is the just the sheer span of it. Mm -hmm. You know, he started recording in the 1950s and kept going past the year 2000. So you really get sort of a a 50 year plus chunk of the history of the genre just through him. And from the early stuff that is, yeah, I would call it like just straight up rock music, really, like White Lightning, <laughs> songs that's like it, that. That's it. Yeah. I mean, you could you could sneak that song into some a playlist of fifties rock music and no one's even gonna realize they're listening to country music. <laughs> Dude, what where's where's the place that people can go to get more information about you so they can see what you have done with music history and what you do with your podcast? Uh just cocaine and rhinestones.com is a great one stop shop. Find out about the podcast, find out about the book, all that good stuff. Excellent. Please come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you, Tyler. Incredible. Arrow, this was a great conversation. Thank you so much. Will you be brilliant today, okay? Yes, sir. You too. Thank you. Okay, guys, Arrow is in the house. Arrow, hello. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Hello. What's up, you two crazy nuts? How are you guys doing? (laughs) (laughs) Good, man. Thank you, man. Man. The dream catcher worked because here we are. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You guys and this podcast, it is such a cool concept, and you're proving to people that a single thought, playing the parts of your moms, is, is, God, dude, I feel like I'm reliving my life with my own mom because I'm thinking like you guys. (laughs) <laughs> well, you're wel- you're welcome, Arrow. You're welcome, my friend. <laughs> it, it, to, to get together to do this, I mean, because, I mean, that's one thing. First of all, I always believe that birthdays are a celebration of motherhood. So that's how close I am to your podcast, because it, you're really honoring your moms. Oh, that's awesome. That That's such a great way to put it. Uh, I've never heard anybody, you know, mention their birthday and motherhood at the same time. But it's it's so very true. But but that's how we we, we kind of got into this. You know, Joe and I have been friends for quite some time. And we basically always came back to the fact that we were always given great advice from our mothers and thinking, how can we channel that? How can we be great conduits of the gift we've been giving and pass down from our own mothers? So we thought, look, we're not licensed therapists. We're not professionals in the least. 
But given our experiences in, I think, show business and social dynamics of everything that come along with that, why not take this to the road? And so we we tried it out and it's been, God, I mean, it's been over a year now and we've had a blast doing it. Yeah. I'll tell you how effective it is in my own personal life is that when it comes to young adults at the other essential job, I, I, I sit there and I think of, well, what would my mother do with this situation of this guy that keeps coming in mm-hmm. late? And And so you're teaching me a male... Hey, mom taught me something. Act like your mom for a moment here, and let's let's find some peace on this team. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, a supportive atmosphere and a nurturing mother. We've been we were both lucky to have great moms. who were very active moms as well. Who took a active role in our development as as boys into men. I think it was it was really interesting to have that perspective. And it's more important not to lose that perspective as we get older. I think, and now as we're parents as well. Are you writing I think the commonality we we also share is that. Both our mothers seem to be very blunt and yeah. honest oh, and cut yeah. to the chase. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, for sure. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, well, my mom was the one that would sit there and listen, and then she'd say, Go talk to your dad now. Go tell him what you just told me. And then, and then we'll all meet in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Well, well, I, think, I think the tone and what you're communicating is you're about to get a whooping from dad because mom's physically not going to whoop you. <laughs> now, do you guys write this out and plan it out before you go into it? Or, or because you, you do things live and on the improv, I mean, d- does it come out as it's happening? Yeah, we, we don't get the questions beforehand. We like to get them in the moment. Our producer, uh, Mark, does a great job of curating it for us, and we'll uh, we'll get them in the moment and get an answer live there, which I think is always better. And being friends for such a long time and just brilliant comedians, we're able just to shoot and talk to each other <laughs> for a half hour before, you know, so half of the episode we just basically go down rabbit holes and have just friendly banter beforehand, which is always my favorite part of the show as well. Wow. And the thing that's fun about the show, too, is that the questions go from mundane, trivial to like, you know, what did you have for breakfast today mm-hmm. to some really like deep rooted, um, serious, you know, impactful questions where, you know, granted, that's the nature of the show. We're, we're, we're receiving these and they're almost, I think, you know, kind of blown off some steam by saying, OK, let me let me take this to a comedy podcast and see what happens. And we, we, we do we really do our due diligence in trying to give some great advice. I think I think Joe is usually a lot better at really reading the tea leaves and breaking it down pretty quickly <laughs> and offering up some really, really great advice. Whereas I'll try to I'll try to play devil's advocate. <laughs> <laughs> but he does a fantastic job and there's a reason I love doing the show, but there's also a reason why when I've had certain situations bubble up in my life. Joe is the first person I think to talk to in terms of getting advice. Yeah. Isn't it odd how the older we get, we realize how wise we are and it comes up like, like on your podcast, I'll sit there and go, Holy crap. That I, I never even thought of that. And it's like, and you guys yeah. are sharing your wisdom. Yeah. I'll, I'll say stuff that sounds like a motivational poster at times. And I'll be like, <laughs> where'd that come from? <laughs> you know, but uh, that's, it's fun too. Is cause like through the conversation, I think you get there and, you know, Steve does a good job curating those moments as well, where we'll we'll realize we haven't answered the question yet. We've had a lot of fun <laughs> talking and, and joking around and, you know, sh- sharing a little bit of our life experience because we're both older gentlemen that's been, been through a lot at this point of our lives, you know, ups and downs and whatnot. So, but I think after a little while, we'll realize, okay, now let's get into it. Uh, let's get into the nitty gritty. And uh, that's could be a lot of fun. How are people reacting? Are they reaching out to you after these podcasts? Because I find myself talking to to the the actual system in my car, but it's like it's like God. How do, not everybody gets this opportunity to talk to you guys like this. Yeah, I think what we're. I think you really see the impact when you're out on the road. You know, after shows. Mm-hmm. I mean, after shows, I meet people, um, and they're very complimentary, and and it, it it almost does feel like a community. We've curated our own little niche out there in the podcast world where people feel comfortable to understand you're not the only one with problems, you're not the only one with issues. And the fun thing is that we'll we'll take those issues as serious as they are and still try to infuse some levity along the way and make you feel good about the situation and know that there's other people out there, including us, that are there to be supportive of you. Now, Joe meets people after his shows and it's called a meet and greet and they cost money. You can just meet me for free. That's how accessible I am. Uh, I meet people. I meet people for free sometimes. I would say. I would say that the big thing too is like we'll get follow up, right? We'll get people who will yeah. send another Instagram message to our, uh, you know, two cool moms pod uh, account and be like, "Hey, that worked." So, you know, we we worked it out, or like 
hey, dummies, that didn't work. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll get a lot of follow up, which is interesting too, to, to actually people because it is a community we're building and, uh, you know, reminding everybody that we're all just trying to get through this life together. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's like you define compassion and perform compassion without really pulling out the dictionary. We hear it in your voice, your pitch, volume and tone that, wow, here, this is what they mean by compassion. That's such a great point, too. And I think I think you you know, when we get these questions sometimes, especially the really serious ones, I think that's where uh, to be honest with you, I think the podcast strength is Joe and his compassion for humanity in general. He's got such a big heart. I think we both have big hearts. But I think when you listen to the podcast, you really hear, OK, this is somebody in need. Let's do our due diligence. Let's do the best job we can. And Joe's usually the one that kicks these things off mm -hmm. where I, I think the more serious questions. So to your point, Arrow, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And it comes down to communication, right? And communication, it, it, tone and reflection. I, I think that really the cadence of how somebody's communicating is so much more important sometimes. And don't you? Yeah, because we'll talk about the end of the day. You know, th these people are in a spot where they're reaching out to two strangers on the uh, <laughs> on the Internet <laughs> for help. So, like, it's like, you know, we should try to do what we can to give them a little bit of advice. And don't you find yourself in a position of now that you're a leader and, and, and that leadership is through a podcast where we can't see your facial expressions. So therefore, we, we have to listen to what's going on. Oh, I think people who luck out, they don't have to look at our grotesque faces. <laughs> and I appreciate what you said around that. I mean, I, I read between the tea leaves there, as Steve said. Uh, so, yeah. And I, I also find my voice very annoying. So it's <laughs> not a good thing. But no, I think, I think it's really, I, I think you do get, people do understand the, there is a genuine, uh, you know, humanity behind the podcast as well on top of it. But first and foremost, Steve, I've chose, we've chose professions to bring joy and laughter to people. That's what we try to do to pay the bills. And we're so fortunate to have that as our life. And that's not lost on us. So we thought this is another medium to be able to do that. I love the way that you guys have taken this out onto the live stage. And the reason why is because my call at the Comedy Zone used to tell me all the time as podcast was getting, they, they were starting to get popular. He says, they're going to come from the podcast. They're going to bring their shows here. This is a new layer of connection with people who need that medicinal. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you because I, I think, you know, for example, Joe's got, you know, his first hour special coming out very shortly um, that, you know, fans want to dig into it. Feel free, by all means, follow Joe on socials. You'll, you'll learn about it. But I think what happens is there's that dynamic of going out there and monologizing, being a monologist for 60 minutes. And, and you're getting a slice of insight from that person. But the podcast, I think, bring accessibility yes. from anybody who enjoys that individual doing stand-up to yep. really kind of like you're really peel, peeling back the layers and, and really understanding who this person is. So so as much as a podcast is popular, it's popular because there, there's gravity to that individual and people want to, they want to learn more. They want to hear a little more. They want a little more insight. And I think, I think that's the great thing about our podcast is that we are literally kind of like opening the doors we're not talking about like being on the road and this yeah, wacky yeah. thing happened to us. It's like, we're really getting into things that bind us all together, which are, you know, dilemmas and issues as serious as they are, or as lighthearted as they are, you're, you're kind of like learning how we think and how yeah. we break down things. Wow. And there's a, we run the gamut. I remember one episode, literally we covered what was the best horror movie. You know that we were talking about like what was, we went back and forth somebody asked us like what was one of the best harm movies we'd ever seen then we talked about um you know how to how to admit you're wrong to your partner mm. and then i think we also spoke about losing a parent and it was all in one episode wow. and it was like we really like run the whole gamut here and on top of that we were making jokes about everything in the beginning so it really is a wild ride and uh even for us as the hosts wow you guys have got to come back to this show anytime in the future the door is always going to be open for you Oh, no, thank, thank you, you so Aaron. much. Thank Appreciate you. Very kind of you, buddy. You guys be brilliant today, okay? Thank Will you. Do. You as well, buddy. Continue Th success. Thank you. Hello and good morning, everybody. There you are. Good morning, friend. How are you? Doing very well. Yeah, I've always got interviews before interviews, so I'm always, I'm always, I'm booked to book to book. I figured book. you did. Yep. You, <laughs> I, I figured you did. You're a busy man. A busy man. <laughs> Absolutely. I hope you're doing How well. How was your weekend? Uh, I am. How was your weekend? Uh, it's, I uh, had uh, the 20th annual ice cream party uh, the, uh, on our neighborhood last night, so it's uh, we, we get together and we share ice cream and swap stories. Oh, 
that sounds fun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, okay. and then of course the new neighbors came well, in, so I was you know we you know put it making uh -huh. making some uh, homemade ice cream. The whole works, man. Oh wow, wow, <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> I still do my ice cream, though. There you, you know. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so when will this be aired, Errol? On um, Thursday the 5th. Okay. Look at me all prepared this time. Most of the time, I'm the one digging around. I see. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I am impressed. <laughs> all right. Thursday the 5th. All right. Don't do it during the Chiefs game. Okay. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Hold on a second. Oh, yeah. And the... And the um, you, 10 o'clock. Okay, cool. Be beautiful, beautiful. Okay, all right. Hold on just a second. And they're ready. Have a great interview. Thank Talk you. Talk to you tomorrow, probably. You bet. Okay, hold on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we have an arrow on the line. Hello and good morning, Brian. How are you doing today? I'm good. Nice to talk to you again. Absolutely. Well, you know, I mean, I have to talk with you because, I mean, you continue to grow this atmosphere of information, and I am addicted to information. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. That's uh, that's uh, you are you are the uh, the reader we're looking for. How is it that you're able to uncover all of this stuff? I mean, you must be your nose must be in books, encyclopedias. It must be all over the web. You keep delivering each and every book. You know, it's a, that that is my day. I'm I'm in books. I'm on the internet. I'm, I'm at the library. I look at their newspapers and magazines. People send us stuff. It's a it's a cool job. I get to just curate all this stuff. And there's we're never going to run out of stuff to to write about. Um, as long as people are still wild and weird and wonderful and making things and breaking things and breaking the law and <laughs> inventing things, there's always going to be something to write about. And there and you know and, and stuff that you know I've known about for years and. Like, just never even noticed. Like, oh, hey, that, that probably has an interesting origin story. In a very creative way, uh, don't you find yourself saying, wow, I, I'm getting this information because I'm open to receive this information. It's, it's almost like you're, you're a portal. I, I do feel like that. Yeah, that's very, it, it, it does feel like that. Yeah, where I'm just, I leave myself open to it because the ideas come, like, I, uh, I just, I just kind of absorb information like throughout my day, like, oh, that'll be a, that'd be a good article. Like I'll notice something or I'll hear something or I'll, you know, see something on TV and I'll just, just write it down and file it away. And like, I do feel like a, yeah, like a portal. That's a, it's a very good way of putting it. Yeah. And this time around there, are, there are games. I mean, like, is, is it a truck name or is it a person's name? See how you, you envision we who are reading this book. You know, I just I like to mix it up. You know, sometimes you need a short read, sometimes you need a long read, yeah. and uh, and sometimes you don't you don't want to read a wall of text. You just want to you know do something silly, like you know try to guess whether the name belongs to an American gladiator or a monster truck. <laughs> what are we going to learn in this new book? Um, you're going to learn uh, a lot of origins, a lot of really trivial stuff. You're going to learn a lot of really fascinating stuff about stuff that you think you know that you didn't know, like uh, Mork and Mindy. Uh, Robin Williams was not the original actor in mind for that part. Really? Which I, I, I kind of always thought, you know, I grew up watching that show. You know, we all love Robin Williams. I thought that that show was created for him because he was such a, a big deal comedian. But they, uh, they wanted to create a space alien character uh, for Happy Days because – Star Wars was so big at the time. Yeah, yeah. And so they auditioned all these L.A. comics, and Richard Lewis almost got the part, but he couldn't figure out how to do an alien voice. It kept coming out Scandinavian, yeah. he said. <laughs> so, he, so he said, like, he said, like, look, Robin Williams is, is auditioning after me. Just go ahead and hire him. He is exactly who you want for this part to play a, a zany space alien. And, and he was right. Yeah, but you know, though, he couldn't have held his own on that in the way, because I thought Pam Dauber and everybody else around him, they, they, to me, it was a gelled team. It was the perfect atmosphere for Robin to be, you know, Mork. Yeah, yeah, great, great chemistry. Um, another fun fact about Mork and Mindy is they, they changed the way TV was made. Um, before then, sitcoms were filmed with three cameras. Yeah. They, had to, they added a fourth camera just to catch Robin Williams uh, ad-libbing and improvising and, and doing, you know, his shtick, basically. So, and so now uh, live-action sitcoms are filmed with four cameras because 
because of Robin Williams. See, that's the reason why I love your books, Uncle John's Bathroom Reader. And the reason why is because you take something like Mork and Mindy, which is still on TV, because I watch it on Wii TV, and they're, they're able to give you these old shows. You take subjects that were actually, it's still in our lives today. Yeah, that's, there's, it's, it's yeah, yeah, as, uh, as our world fills out, you know, more and more things come out, there's, there's these things that are, that are still around, just in the consciousness, that we, we still don't know the full story of, and yeah. I just, I think that's so cool, uh, you know, Goldfish Crackers, like, I learned how Goldfish Crackers came about, because uh, a Nazi codebreaker, after World War II, made this machine to make Goldfish Crackers, because his wife was a Pisces, <laughs> he's like i'll make these mini crackers and i'll make fish shaped well because my my wife's star symbol is a fish of course like it's just like it, there's there's nothing mundane in the world everything has a story everything everything has layers to it don't you think that everything that you put into these pages it really is just another way of communicating the, and and as you uncover it it's like oh my god this has a connection to communications Absolutely, it's uh, it's it's kind of sacred, honestly. Like yeah. we, we, the the more we learn, the more we learn about each other. We connect with each other. The world is a little bit less mysterious. Um, we we just that's knowledge is power, and uh, it's it's really it's really just nice to know you learn something and, and to just demystify something for yourself. It's uh. And that's, and that's something we get to share with people. You're going to think this is really weird, Brian, but I, I've got the books and I put them at, in the bathrooms at the essential job and I, and I have a pin connected to it. And I, and I ask people to sign the book after they've re, after they paged through the book because I want to know oh, how far they got into it. I, to me, that's part of the, I, I, I always see it as an invitation from you to do that. Absolutely. Sure. I mean, that, that's what, that's what I love about these is you can, you can open it up and you'll find something. You'll find something Always. that interests you. We, we try to cover as many subjects as possible and you can just kind of open it random and find something on history, find something on science, find something on pop culture, a, a, a trivia quiz. Like, uh, it's, uh, luck of the draw. Is there anything that shocked you on this one? Did you, did you pick something up going, holy cow, I had no clue. Um, just kind of like putting everything in perspective. I, I did a page on, um, I figured out how many sheets worth of toilet paper thick everything is <laughs> like, uh, like the Washington monument is like 900,000 sheets of toilet paper tall. Like, it just, just kind of putting it in, in that perspective just makes you realize, Oh, that, that, that thing is both much, much taller than I thought it was, but also like. <laughs> oddly relatable because like oh it's just a you know that's a thing you have at your house <laughs> where can people go to find out more about you and and really dig into what you're what you're delivering oh we're at uh we're at portablepress.com and uh, a lot of stuff on there um a lot of our older books you can get on there uh, we do a blog where we we update that a lot about you know about the holidays and just kind of just kind of extra bonus bathroom reader content. Um, and then the book is uh, the book is everywhere and anywhere. I love it. You know you've got an open door to always come back to the show, dude. Oh well, thank you. It's uh, it's it's great to be here. I love your show. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? Well, thank you so much. That's uh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Hello and good morning. Hey, Arrow, how you doing? Fantastic, man. Looking forward to talking with you, dude. Absolutely. And Van Morrison is the subject this time around. Oh, my God. What, what really drew you into this one? Well, I've always been a fan of Van. I mean, uh, he's, you know, one of the uh, preeminent singer-songwriters. You know, he's crossed a lot of different uh, movements in, in uh, rock and roll history, starting with the British Invasion when... You know, he was with them and then crossing into the singer songwriter movement, late 60s, early 70s, and uh, really kind of forging his own sound. Uh, he, he's an incredible, versatile, uh, incredibly versatile uh, artist who really kind of embodies like four different artists in one guy. <laughs> you know, he's one of those artists that in my life, it was one of those, he belonged to that band, that's him? And and it was with the group Them, because I had no clue until I was doing music research. Yeah, and then, you know, it started off as a band, but it kind of just kind of grew into just Van and a bunch of studio musicians. You know, they had a, an, a revolving door of uh, personnel coming through during Van's time there. Uh, and, you know, there was... It was just one of those deals where the, the management was kind of shady and they were always throwing out 
the groups that uh, as them it wasn't necessarily Van Morrison and them, but you know it's such it's it, you know the the releases from sixty four to sixty six were Van Morrison and uh, you know essentially like I said him with a bunch of studio musicians. Uh, so you really kind of get in Van Morrison solo there when you don't even realize it. Wow. One of the things that I've always loved about Van Morrison is that you you can put on the album or you can ask Alexa to play Van Morrison and, and you're it's a portal. It, you escape this realm of where we are right now and he takes you wherever you want to go. Yeah, he's, he definitely has moods about him and, uh, it's, you know, it's... Uh, it's very uh, spiritual for him in a lot of ways. You know, I know he's a, he's a cranky guy, but he does seem to be a spiritual, uh, faithful guy on, on some level, you know, and uh, it, it comes through in his music. It's particularly, you know, from the 80s on to up to today. Well, one of the things that I've noticed about him is that he's not afraid of being Van Morrison. So many people, they, they become these characters because even, you know, it's, it's one of those where it's like Van Morrison is this in his life, but it's almost like he has a separate life away from that, which he enjoys as well. Right. He's very private, you know, and, um, you know, the thing about him is he's one of those guys who never sings the song the same way twice. And really? I don't know if he does it just to to mess with people, you know, or to, to tick people off or if that's just the way it, the spirit moves him at the time, you know. But uh, uh, and the one thing he's always been able to do is to take an old song. Uh, you know, I know there's a couple of them songs that he did. Uh, when he was touring with the Caledonia Soul Orchestra and made him sound like the stuff he was recording right in that moment, you know? So uh, he's very adaptable uh, and like you say, he's very moody, very ethereal and uh, uh, just, uh, just uh, he's just a wonder to listen. I, I, I'm, I, anybody who's into him is, is, is blessed in a sense. Well, Farrah Fawcett was into him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, you know, that's amazing. You know, the guy's had the... Uh, Guys had uh, quite a love life, um, but, but uh, you know, I, I know he was married to a model too for for quite a long time. I think they divorced a few years ago. But uh, you know, he's an interesting cat, that's for sure. Well, why is it that he hasn't allowed paparazzi or somebody to to cover? I mean, get me because when you when you are hanging out with models and Farrah Fawcett and even Laura Bush loving him as much as she does, it's like that. Those are picture moments, but we don't see those pictures. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how he does it, man. If he has a maybe an underground uh, <laughs> way in and out of his home, <laughs> you know who knows. But uh, he he seems to, uh, and not only that, he's very unassuming looking. I mean, he kind of looks like a like the president of a bank, you know. <laughs> when you see him, it's like he doesn't look like a rock and roll singer. Yeah, Rolling Stone magazine labels him number forty two of greatest artists of all time. I mean, th does he even look at things like that and say, "Yeah, I need to be in the top 50. I got it handled." No, he could care less. He didn't even show up to his own Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, induction ceremony and gave one of those typical Van Morrison. It's all about the music, not about the accolades. Yeah. Uh, statements about it, you know. So he yeah, he could give he could he could care less about that stuff. Well, then let me ask you this: Then is 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 it his mystique? that we fall in love with him? Yeah, I think so. You know, it's, he's, he's had stuff written about him, but you know, it, it, they all come from sources and friends of friends and people from his past. It's, he's a very hard guy to pin down. He does not like to be written about. Um, you know, he's uh, doesn't like to have his music reissued uh, without his blessing or say so. And if it is, he, again, issues these scathing statements saying that his artistic freedom or, or his artistic muse has been taken away. And, uh, you know, he doesn't, he, he doesn't like that. So he's, he's very private, he, you know, and, and he's, and he's not, I don't think he's, you know, he does look back, you know, when, when them, the, they put out a, uh, a, a, a two CD set a few years ago of, of everything them did and had some bonus cuts. And he actually wrote the liner notes and it was very, they were very touching, very moving. He really spoke about that time in his life and what it was like being in them. Uh, but he doesn't do that very often. You know, he's not really a nostalgic kind of guy. So he's always on ready for the next thing. So when you say that he doesn't like things written about him, is that why you haven't written about him? Yeah, I mean, it's you, you, it, he, he's very difficult. It's almost kind of like writing about Bob Dylan. It's yeah. like Bob Dylan is another guy that, you know, uh, after – the 1970s uh, or really the late 1960s he becomes very private very pinned down very hard to to uh to write about you know and uh it's it's you, you have to go uh far and away 
to uh to to find stuff like that and for me personally i would probably have to go to ireland and <laughs> and talk to people there and I, I prefer to to write about uh people that i can kind of identify with yeah. and, you know kind of growing up here in the united states uh and, and the american culture i'm not as familiar with european culture you know not that i couldn't do it uh, and i would certainly if somebody gave me a nice advance to go do it i would certainly get into it but uh not going over there anytime so does he fit into a genre and the reason why i bring that up is because brown eyed girl even though it was on the top 40 charts it's also still one of the biggest beach songs of all time here in the carolinas people shag to it yeah yeah he fits into a lot of genres i mean you could uh, throw the them music in the british invasion you could put him in in uh you could put him in really the singer songwriter soft rock kind of movement of the early 70s uh, he's done a lot of jazz and folk stuff he's done skiffle you know, um, and and he's done. You know, he, I wouldn't say uh, classic. I would say you know his albums probably fit into classic rock, but it's not like guitar driven or drum heavy. It's just good stuff from that era. Problem, problem. <laughs> say that word twice. Problematic, <laughs> problematic. There we go. I said it. The. Uh, I mean, how is it that he's a problematic uh, musician? Uh, you know, he's very. Uh, I think he's a tough guy to work with. Ooh. You know, I think he's very demanding. Um, you know, he likes to change things up on the fly. And uh, I think he's one of those guys that he wants you to, to, to read his mind and, and adapt quickly to what he's changing. He's done that. He's, you know, in some, I, I believe uh, his band or not his band in the street, but I remember in Tupelo Honey, you know, he started off the, the, the record to be an acapella thing or it was street choir. And then, uh, you know, fired the whole band, started over. Yeah. You know, and so uh, it's uh, it's one of those things. I don't know if he's like, if what he's like today, but I would imagine he's probably he probably hasn't changed his stripes too much. Oh my God! Right away, I have a flashback of Bon Jovi. You know, it's like whose name is on the band? My name. Okay, you right. gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. He so, gets all the he gets all the blame. He gets maybe too much too, uh, too much credit and too much of the blame. Oh my God! My God! So the the fiftieth year. How does he celebrate? something like this is he is he going to rely on historians like you to to get that story out there or or does he care i don't think he really cares too much you know uh, it's probably just a number to him I'm, I'm i'm not speaking for him just my guess uh you know he is touring uh, later uh, this month i think he begins but it's you know his tours are short and they usually cover certain cities in europe and america and uh you know he is going out so I recommend if you can catch him, go see it. So you see a, a legend in action. Is he on your bucket list for an interview? Uh, you know what? I, I would love to interview him, but have you ever seen an interview with him? Sometimes they're 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 really awkward. It almost looks like a hostage video. You know, it's, yeah. it's like, you know, I don't I don't know. I would love to talk to him, but uh, I don't know if that's going to happen. Yeah, that's to me when I watch the videos. It, it's like as a viewer, I feel uncomfortable because he sometimes he only gives you those one worded answers, and you're going, "Oh my god, I'm glad I wasn't interviewing him on, interviewing him on that day." Oh, yeah. If you, there's a great clip online you should check out, uh, anybody as your listeners, of Dick Clark interviewing him on American Bandstand with, with Brown Eyed Girl. It's one of the most awkward interviews you're ever going to watch, but it's, it's hilarious. Wow. See, and that's every bit the reason why I love you know having conversations with you, because you inspire people to go do something. You, you're so interactive with your storytelling to where people can you know kind of you know get a little bit more thoughtful about the songs they're listening to. Don't just use the song. Know the song. Yeah, and it, with you know, thing with with all the technology we have and YouTube and things like that, you, you can take a trip back. It's very easy. It's easier than it's ever been. All right, all of your books that you've got out there. Okay, how are they doing for you? You doing good? Oh yeah, we're doing good. I got uh, all the leads are brown. Uh, yes. How the mamas and the papas came together and broke apart is still out there. I'm working on my Waylon Jennings book still, and uh, actually working on a couple documentaries for the Catholic Channel and Sirius XM. So. Yeah. Uh, We'll have those out shortly. I want my hands on that Waylon Jennings book because he, just like Van Morrison, to me, is a big mystery. We only Eight. know those moments where, you know, because all of a sudden, country music had the bad boys. Yeah, and where did they come from? You know, he had been around. If you uh, if you weren't paying attention in 1960, or if you were somewhat paying attention in 1966, you heard of a guy named Waylon Jennings, but then by 1974, he looks completely different and he's dominating, and you're like, wow, where did this guy come from? So there's a lot of stuff that happened to uh, to make that uh, come about, and uh, I, I tell the whole story. Are you going to talk to his grandson? Because he's a great conversation, dude. I'm, I'm, I'm planning on it. I am. I have talked. Uh, I've talked so far with... Uh, mostly people that he worked with, musicians and um, 
he's some people he grew up with uh but uh we're working on the family next man i can't wait for that book dude all right where's the website where people can go to find out more about you tap into what you're doing it is Scott Shea author dot com and Shea is spelled S H E A like the stadium. <laughs> I love it. Come back to the show anytime. You know the door is always open for you, dude. Thanks, Sarah. Appreciate it. Will you be brilliant today, okay? You too, man. Bye guy.